Welcome to the Environmental Leadership Chronicles, a podcast brought to you by the California Association of Environmental Professionals. In this episode, I'm joined by guest co-host Corinne Lytle Bonine, and we feature Kevin Cunningham. Kevin is an environmental practitioner with a strong background in managing the preparation of various CEQA compliant documents for public infrastructure and land development projects. He also has expertise in navigating the regulatory landscape through developing and overseeing the permitting process for projects involving jurisdictional waters. He's actively engaged in mitigation negotiation where he focuses his efforts on looking for opportunities to strike a balance between project goals and environmental preservation. Kevin holds the position of environmental project manager at the Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. He and his team of assistant and associate planners are responsible for providing comprehensive CEQA compliance and permitting services required to deliver stormwater infrastructure projects in accordance with legal requirements and environmental best practices that support implementation of the district's capital improvement plan. Listen in on our conversation with Kevin as he details his journey to where he is now and shares his thoughts on how to increase diversity within the environmental profession. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, I'm Jessa. My pronouns are she, her. And hi, I'm Corinne. My pronouns are she, her. And today we are joined by Kevin Cunningham. He's the environmental project manager with the Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Welcome so much to the podcast, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. My pronouns are uh, he, him. Thank you. I just realized I said I assumed a pronoun before you said it. So um, I had a little... No worries. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. And so first things first, how are you connected to AEP? Yeah, so I was connected with AEP maybe about uh, 11 years ago almost. I was recruited by my... Uh, then and also current manager, Joan Valle, uh, to be on the Inland Empire chapter board. Um, I started out as the newsletter editor and I did two cycles as the newsletter editor. And then after those cycles ended, I was uh, approached by the, den- the by the then president, uh, Cheryl Degano, about what my thoughts might be about being president. And at first I was a little hesitant. Actually, it was a lot hesitant to you know, take <laughs> a big role, but um you know after talking it through and thinking about it i i ended up uh running for president getting elected i served two cycles uh as president for the Inland empire chapter ending in 2019 beginning of 2019. that's amazing i didn't realize that that you were sort of as chapter president that's so wonderful yeah and so now my my involvement is more so just limited to uh attending different, you know, lunchtime events and things like that when they're available, workshops and and of course the conference would which is where I had the opportunity to meet you, Jessa. Oh, thank you for saying it like that. It was more like where I cornered you and said, Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> this is not optional. Um <laughs> and Kevin used to hold one of my favorite AEP conference experiences where we stayed up way too late drinking white Russians at the Santa Barbara conference. What, that yes. must have been yes. seven, eight years ago. Well, I think it was maybe 2015 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Corinne and I have known each other for quite a while. We worked at URS together. And so, you know, having those white Russian sessions really kind of helped get me, I guess, more comfortable you know, with the organization, because I knew my Inland Empire chapter, but I didn't know, you know, all of the other chapters and what they were about and the board members and things like that. So, yeah, that, that good good memories for me as well, Corinne. <laughs> so you heard it here on the podcast. When you run into Kevin, get him a white Russian and connect. <laughs> 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 so, Kevin, um, how can you explain to us how you got started in the environmental industry? Like, why... How did you choose this career path and how, I guess, was it intentional? Like, what's your passion for it? Yeah, so I guess I'll say I didn't choose environmental. Environmental chose me. (laughs) Um, But really, it was kind of by accident, but almost on purpose, I would say. Um, I started, I guess I'll take it back a little bit. Um, I grew up in Yucca Valley and split half of my time in LA visiting family and my dad and stuff like that. So I would spend my school year in Yucca Valley and then I would come down to the su- come down to LA in the summer. And one of the things that I would do when I would stay at my aunt's house or um, different family members' house is just kind of 
draw when I got tired of, you know, hanging out with cousins or, you know, friends that we that uh, lived around the area, I would just draw. And one of the things that I like to draw was like these little maps. And one map I remember I drew just what I remembered, um, what I what I knew of how the city was laid out based on various land landmarks that were important to me. So like there was my aunt's house, there was another aunt's house, my dad owned the nightclub. So I knew where those things were, the mall. And so I just have fun drawing these maps and trying to remember, okay, I know we could take a right and a left here. And so I think that's where, you know, that's how these two places are connected. And so, um, yeah, I just, I think from drawing those maps, I just was always interested in, I guess, layout and, and planning and things like that. And um, I started to think like, as I got older, what do I want to do with my life? And to me, it was just like, okay, I didn't know much about planning or really even that planning existed. And so I thought, well, then it must be architecture that I want to do. You know, architecture deals with buildings. Buildings are what occupy the spaces in between the, on, on this, on these maps. And so I must want to be an architect. Um, and so I pursued architecture straight out of high school. And when I say pursue, I, what I really mean is that I applied to Cal Poly Pomona to go to their architecture program. That was one of three schools that I applied to. Uh, the second school was University of Laverne and the third school was Cal State Fullerton. Um, so I don't know how much you guys know about those schools, but only Cal Poly has an architecture program. I'm not sure what I was doing or why I decided <laughs> to apply to the other two. Um, but I went on a campus tour and visited Laverne after after being accepted. And they talked to me about this create a major program where basically I think they set you up to um, uh, get ready for a, a master's in architecture or whatever you want to do by trying to compare the curriculums that are available at those schools and what classes they have available and trying to, you know, just sort of shoehorn a major for you so that you can pursue whatever it is your goal is. So I went to Laverne for two years um, after after I decided, you know, or after not getting accepted to Cal Poly, I went to Laverne for a couple of years and it was okay, you know, doing the creative major program, but I, I really wasn't doing what I felt like I should be doing uh, going through that program. So I started to look at what my other options might be. And one of the things that I did was I looked at um, different architecture programs and and what their requirements for admission would be. And so I looked at a, a school called SciArc, Southern California Institute of Architecture. And on their uh, master's program um, admissions requirements page, I think they had a list of related majors that they had identified as majors that would be easy for people to transition into with an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And on that was urban planning. So I looked up urban planning because I didn't know anything about what that was at the time. And I thought, OK, well, this seems kind of interesting. Maybe I'll maybe I'll try to get into um, maybe I'll better my chances of getting into the master's program, because at that point it was still architecture. I didn't really know what planning was, but I thought maybe I'd better my chances into getting into a master's program by having an urban planning undergrad as opposed to this sort of create a major program that I was in at University of Laverne. And so I applied to Cal Poly. I got into the um, I got into the undergrad program for uh, urban planning and transferred in my third year. Um, but it was at it was at orientation that I realized, you know what, for the planning program, this is really what I was thinking planning or uh, architecture was. And I just didn't know that this was, you know, something separate architecture um, has to offer. I was never really interested in the building per se. It was more so about the space that the buildings occupy. And so, um, you know, whether it's a commercial shopping center, how do you lay out the building so that you can get enough parking and things like that? Or just the city in general, why is the grocery store here and the school there and, you know, things like that. Those were the types of things that, that interested me. And um, planning is that, you know, more so than architecture is. So, um, so yeah, I did. I'm, I I graduated from Cal Poly with a planning degree, uh, but during my time at Cal Poly, I had the opportunity to do an internship in transportation planning, and I interned at a company named Katsukitsu and Associates. 
from 2007 up until I graduated. And at the end of my internship, I was offered, you know, a full-time position. Um, the full-time position didn't really pan out the way that I was expecting it to. Um, it was during the recession, 08, 09 era. So, you know, when I first got the job at Katsukitsu, things were great. You know, they allowed me to work um, as much as I wanted to, at least 20 hours a week, which was awesome. That was my first, you know, office experience and my first real job, so to speak. And I just loved, you know, the flexibility and things like that that they offered. And the fact that I was going to be doing something related to what I was learning in school. Um, so I um, I graduated. Um, it didn't pan out the way that I was hoping that it would pan out with, be, with us being in the recession at that time. And so shortly after being hired on full time, um, I was let go officially. But I was work in 2009 and towards the end of 2009. But I still continued working with them in contract staff capacity on an as needed basis. Eventually, over time, um, the the uh, need for me started to dwindle more and more until I just ended up not working at all. And I remember one of the things that one of my final capstone professors said, you know, because they knew that we were going into this recession and things were going to be hard. But one of my one of the things that stuck with me was never leave planning for as or at least as long as you can hold on to planning, stick with it, try to ride the wave and, um, you know, uh, build your career there because most people who leave the profession never end up coming back to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can do. And um, if you find something that you're that you're happy with, then chances are you're not going to go back to, you know, I have this degree in planning. Let me see where I can go with that, especially as you start to establish yourself in what, whatever that other uh, career ends up being. So that stuck with me. Um, I had, you know, a rough time up until 2011, just trying to figure it out. Um, I would go on these interviews for all the city jobs that were that were coming available and run into like all of my classmates from Cal Poly and we're all just kind of competing for the same jobs. And so at some point I was like, you know what, I need to do something different to set myself apart. Yeah, I had the transportation planning uh, internship on my on my resume, but I think I really need to build it up. And so I just started to apply to every internship, every assistant planner job that I that I found. Um, and eventually um, I ended up finding URS and, and started looking into the consulting world. Uh, I think initially after graduating, the thought was, you know, maybe Maybe I'll try the city planning route um, or not necessarily after graduating because I was still with uh, Katsukitsu, but I was also still open to what other opportunities might might be available to me. And my two interests were transportation and redevelopment. So I started looking into um, agencies where I could maybe work for a redevelopment agency uh, or this or let me step back. I started looking into uh counties, organizations where I could work for maybe the redevelopment agency or consulting firms where I could work on redevelopment projects. And I think that's how I found URS and some of the other uh, big firms that are out there. Um, and so in that time from being laid off, uh, I guess officially from 2009 to 2011, I was just trying to do odd little jobs until I could you know, land something that, that would work. Uh, for me full time, meet my needs in terms of what I want to do and, excuse me, you know, that type of thing. So I uh, went to URS and I was kind of like taken aback because it seemed like they had a few different positions that I met the requirements for, but there was this one uh, position in Ontario and I had applied for it a couple times, had never heard back from it. And then finally, I just called up to the URS office in Ontario and I was like, you know what, who's the planning manager here? I'd like to be able to connect with them uh, directly because I think that I have the skills and the the experience that they're looking for, for, you know, this assistant planner level job, but I haven't heard anything back. So I'm not sure if, you know, my stuff is getting lost or, or, or if it's, if there's just such a big stack, but I thought if I can reach out to that person directly, maybe that'll give me a better shot. And so within a couple of weeks, um, I heard back the plan. His name was Rice. Um, and I got an interview and I interviewed with Joan Valle and uh, a woman named Virginia Viado. 
And I really hit it off with Joan. And we, um, she, uh, within a few months, I was offered a position. It didn't go very quickly, even after that first interview. <laughs> but by April, interviewed in February, and by April, I was having my first day. So that's kind of how I ended up getting to environmental. It was, you know, kind of taking these little uh, detours along the way, um, and not even realizing that this was what I wanted to do. But the nice thing was that once I got hired at URS, Joan was working on redevelopment agency projects for the county of Riverside. And so that allowed me to kind of fulfill this other um, idea of what I wanted to do. I had done transportation as far as my internship went, and I liked it. But I think with the type of transportation that I was doing, one of the things that I realized was that, you know what, I'm more interested in transit more so than I'm interested in transportation. I was doing traffic impact analysis and I don't know about you guys, but um, a lot of times when people graduate from planning programs, they have these dreams about moving into like a big metropolitan area uh, or a downtown area, riding the subway everywhere and not having to have a car. And so I was doing this job as an intern and as an assistant planner and all of my all the conclusions of all, of all of my reports is that we need to add a lane or we need to restrike where the freeway needs to be widened and so i wasn't that wasn't really what i was thinking transportation planning was and so i, I was happy to get this opportunity with urs to now kind of delve into redevelopment agency redevelopment project that's where i started out doing CEQA. i was doing um initial studies um for re redevelopment agency projects uh, for the county of Riverside. And the goal there was, at least between my, my supervisor at the time and, and me, was that she wanted to focus on getting more into the water industry and hand me over the redevelopment agency as a client that I could just start to uh, develop uh, my own relationship with. So, so yeah, I guess, long story short, that's how I got into uh, environmental planning. That's wonderful. What an amazing story of perseverance and just like Thank keeping you. at yeah. it and getting that advice, you know, very early on from your professor and just not giving up and, you know, making this established career out of it. I think that's so incredible. And what an important message and example of just keep trying and trying different avenues and getting creative. Well, you know, I saying like, well, this isn't working. Let me try this. And I just, I was, thank you for sharing. I just think that's really commendable and very inspiring to hear, um, you know, how hard you work to get to where you're at. Thank you. And then when, Kevin, when you do, you know, calculate your years of experience, um, how many of those childhood years do you use doing your map making? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've never even thought about it, but that is, you know, some legit experience and that's, you know, sparked the thought or the idea that I could do this as a career to begin with. So I might have to revamp my resume and include, you know, 12 all the way up. I think that's fair. I think you should. <laughs> I love that. I thought, I thought that was a really great start to this. And I thought, I, I think, oh gosh, I have so many takeaways from what you just said was that I think it's so you know, you did this just out of passion and interest, like started drawing these maps out of curiosity and being curious about the world around you and having that view of why is this here and why is that here? And how do you get from A to B? And, but not realizing there's an industry around it. And I think I relate to on that note, we, I'm from a, a small town in middle America and I just didn't have a understanding of the world around me and all the opportunities. And so listening to your story, it's, it just highlights, I think, the critical importance of mentorship, which is something we're talking a lot about with AEP and, and organizations like AEP, professional organizations, where you can see in this podcast, frankly, you can see all the different career paths and what is out there in the world and you know, being a student and getting more exposed to different career paths and that they, these things exist and what they are. And um you know, that's another question I was going to ask you is, did you have a mentor like in college or, you know, when you're doing this job search, like when you graduated, like during the recession, um, you know, trying to find, you know, your footing in the planning industry, like, did you have any mentors during this time? You know, I didn't have any mentors, I would say up until, um, I guess, 
I get, well, let me step back. From high school up to applying to college, there weren't any mentors, you know, and I think that's why I was so confused about what um, I wanted to do and thinking that it was architecture. Um, in high school, you know, the focus is really just on getting through the requirements. So for me, it was, I knew that I wanted to go to, a, or at least one of the schools that I wanted to, or two rather, were Cal State schools. So I knew that I needed to hit the A through G requirements, and that's what I think outsourcers were focused on. We might have talked about what architecture looks like, or or we might have talked about what I wanted to do, and I and I probably would have mentioned architecture, but it didn't beyond that to talk about why do you want to do architecture or what exactly about architecture is it that interests you. Um, and then you know tying back to my parents, my parents are. Um, from Belize. So I was, um, I, I guess, second generation immigrant. They were born there. I was born here. And Belize is third world. Um, they don't have planning there. So no one, you know, knew what planning was about as far as my parents went either. Um, I think they saw enough about, um, I think they, I think, or rather, I think that me saying that I wanted to do architecture was good enough for for them and so you know they just kind of let me do my thing when i got to college i would say i didn't really have any mentors there either um it probably wasn't until i got to actually it was probably not until i got laid off that one of the odd jobs that i was working was in the same building as caltrans district 8 and I met a woman um, who was working on the floor above me. I was doing um, like this data entry clerk, clerical type job. Um, and Caltrans was on the floor above. And we just kind of ran into each other in the elevator, I think. And I said, oh, hey, you work at Caltrans. What type of work do you do? And she started explaining it to me. And I told her a little bit about my background and my story. And I was interested in, you know, any job really that, that could get me back into uh, planning. And so she started kind of helping me out um, with updating my resume, um, letting me know how to go about the application process for uh, Caltrans, um, and and just really helping me in that way. And we and we still keep in touch you know, to this day. It's been a little while since we last connected, but I would say she was probably my first official mentor. Um, after that, I would say it was probably just you know, various supervisors that I've had across the over the years that would just kind of help me and uh, shepherd me in the right direction. I would consider any of my supervisors really a mentor because they've all helped me in some way, from Jeff Rice to Joan in Virginia, um, even my my supervisors at um, Katso Kitsu, Melissa Dugan and uh, Megan Orlando, all of them have been mentors in some way or another, but I, 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 I haven't had like an official you know, um, person who's just been there the entire time, just kind of guiding me through the process. So just collecting these nuggets from multiple people, which is, yeah. you know, makes you well-rounded, right? <laughs> Trying to put them together as best as I can. Yeah. I love that. And so can you tell us more about your current role with Riverside County flood control? Yeah, so I'm an environmental project manager. Um, the work that we do is in support of our design and construction primarily. So I, we do uh, CEQA and regulatory permitting in the group that I'm in for uh, capital improvement projects. Um, so storm drains, recharge basins, uh, channels, uh, all of those projects need some form of CEQA to be prepared for it, a CEQA document. And because all of the facilities, or for the most part, most of the facilities that we have do with water, um, there's a regulatory permitting component associated with it as well. So 1,600 permits from CDFW, 404 permits from the Army Corps of Engineers, and 401 permits from the Regional Board. Um, that's, I guess, kind of the general scope of what we do for the district. My group in particular, um, like I said, does CIP uh, or environmental compliance for CIP projects, but we also do environmental compliance for developer build projects and special projects that we partner with uh, the jurisdictions, the local jurisdictions of Riverside County on. And so, um, thank you. And with this is, you know, you've, you've talked about the environmental uh, profession, your career in planning. And so what's your, what's your dream? 
for the environmental profession and, you know, as a leader, what changes do you want to see and, or are you making? I think as far as like what I would like to see, um, You know, I have an appreciation for all of the regs that we have to go through uh, in California in particular and all of the things that we have to do to develop um, to develop anything. Uh, I think all of those regs and uh, requirements that we have to abide by are what makes California uh, one of the most attractive places to want to live and why we have some of the most beautiful natural resources here in the United States. And so um, what I would like to see, though, is a way where we can streamline uh, these regs and and really get away from weaponizing CEQA to slow down or stop or kill projects from from being able to move forward. There are some projects that, you know, don't need to go forward because they're just not that good. You know, but I think a lot of times there are projects where that's not the case and there you know, they, they get tripped up because of the process that we have to go through. So as far as my dream, I'd like to see uh, a world, I guess, where the environmental process can just be much more streamlined, but we're still meeting the intent of what the regs uh, require of us. Because uh, like I said, we live in California um, and people want to live here for a reason. And I think a re the regs that we have are a big part of that. And so I don't think that they should go away. You know, obviously that would get rid of all of our jobs here, right? But um, I do think that there's a need to kind of streamline um, what that what that looks like. These days it's taken, you know, anywhere between six and 24 months to do a CEQA document. Is there a way that that can be done faster, you know, so that we can meet the intent of, of what we're what we're concerned about while still, you know, allowing things to go forward. I don't know, but I would love to see more um, focus in that area. And I think, you know, Kevin, to that end, and definitely a shameless plug to the AEP uh, Legislative Committee is, you know, obviously the last three or so years have been just kind of triage at the state level because we were dealing with the pandemic and, you know, a lot of focus was on that. But what we're seeing now is there's a temperature on both sides of the aisle to make common sense, streamlining reforms to CEQA. And we might have just enough to, you know, especially for projects, critical infrastructure projects, housing projects, renewable energy projects, uh -huh. um, where we can maybe get enough consensus to make some of those common sense reforms so that we can look at, you know, really what the intent of CEQA was and doing it quicker and better than what we're seeing now. How do, how are these changes made? Like, is it, are they on the ballots? Are there, is there legislation that just can be enacted? Like what has to happen for some of these efficiencies to be implemented or to be approved? You know, it, it it seems like it's just an act of legislature that tends to happen. And, and all of a sudden, this is what we're doing. And I think there's a process to be able to comment on, you know, is this how we should do it? I don't I don't think I've seen a lot, though, in terms of environmental regs on uh, come through on ballots where, you know, the whole the general population gets to vote on it. I think it tends to be, you know, bills and things like that that'll come down if you're in the know then you can, you know, comment on it. If you're not, then, you know, you just kind of deal with the the outcome of whatever that decision ends up being. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I, at least that's been how I've seen things come about. I don't know, Corinne, do you have another uh, perspective on that? Yeah, no, I, I think, Evan, you know, I think the vast majority come from uh, updates to uh, legislation, you know, coming out of Congress. I think in uh, limited instances, we can see, you know, executive orders coming from Gavin Newsom that won't um, necessarily, you know, revise the statute of CEQA since that is, you know, legislation itself. Um, we will get, you know, fairly significant updates occasionally coming out of OPR um, using their kind of executive branch function where they will update the CEQA guidelines. Um and sometimes that's in response to legislation. Sometimes that's in response to best practices. Um, but that can also be in response to uh, case reviews and uh, legal suits that have made their way through the court. So that's kind of the other way that CEQA either changes or gets reinterpreted 
um, is, you know, through court decisions, which, you know, can occasionally then get codified in guideline uh, updates from OPR. Yeah. I think one of the things that I wanted to uh, touch on in terms of my vision for the um, the uh, profession, I think that was what you had asked me a few minutes ago, just mm -hmm. was that, you know, I'd like to see a little more diversity in the in the profession. You know, one of the things that I took away from the conference was during the DEI um, program, which was, I think, on the first day that we were there. And there was a report that was done by the committee where they showed that only 1% of the membership is Black. And I know that, you know, it, it's obvious to me when I when I look at, you know, the rooms that I'm in, when I go to different conferences and things like that. But I think seeing it on paper was, I guess, more eye opening uh, that it really is that slim. And so I'd like to see, you know, uh, an environment where there is just a little more representation or at least it's representative of maybe what the state um, of California's population breakdown ends up being. Um, I can speak to myself, like I personally didn't know anything about what planning was until, you know, just kind of stumbling my way through and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I think that tends to be the case with a lot of uh, people of color, uh, especially people who migrate here. Um, you know, a lot of times when you have family who was born elsewhere and then you and then you're the first. I guess, generation that's born in the United States, there's a big focus on just being successful. Happiness is secondary when it comes to your uh, profession. And so there's like a short list of acceptable um, degrees and, and, and jobs that you can pursue. And it's usually medical, law, um, you can do some sort of entrepreneurship, like open, open up your own business of some sort, but it's usually just a short list of things. And so um, I think, educating people at all levels about the potential for a career in environmental um, would help to get us to that point where we see a little more representation across the board. Um, I've been lucky enough to get to a point in my career where I am part of the hiring decisions for you know senior planner and below um, in our organization. And there's just not a lot of people of color that come through even in, in the application process. It, you know, it's not that, you know, um, the profession wants to look a certain way. It's just that there aren't applicants that are coming through that that represent that diversity. And so that's one of the things that I would like to see as well as, you know, just a little more representation and and um, diversity across the board. That yeah. was the thought. That was great. <laughs> and then in. <laughs> You know, discussions we've had, especially at the state board about, you know, what can AEP do to help make the, you know, environmental profession more diverse? Kind of what we've keyed into is, you know, having that four year <clears throat> or more degree can be a significant barrier to entry because of how difficult um, you know, getting into the four-year schools and getting the degrees can be for people of color in this country. Um, and then also exactly what you said, Kevin, was just the spreading the, you know, information that not only, you know, are there good paying jobs available, you know, in the environmental profession, but, you know, maybe something, you know, we can do at AEP is kind of enhance the way we describe environmental professions so that we can include, you know, some of the environmental technologists and, um, uh, wastewater tax and hazardous waste tax and stuff that don't necessarily require that for your degree, but still would find, you know, the content and what we do here at AEP to be helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I guess wondering if, um, you know, if, if what would have been helpful to you? And not that I'm, you know, I don't want to ask you to solve the EP's problems <laughs> with diversity mm -hmm. because that's not fair, but would, you know, Hearing about it at a, you know, high school, middle school level, you know, maybe shifted that drive from wanting to be an architect to, you know, being a planner or, um, yeah, maybe I'll stop rambling and maybe see if you have any ideas on, on what could have been beneficial to you at that age. I think that um, having maybe, so 
elementary, middle school, I think is a little early for someone to start thinking about what they want to do for their entire life. But maybe their parents need to be educated about the different types of opportunities that are out there so that they can start having those conversations when they see certain things in their children about what is it that you want to do with your life? You know, you're interested in birds and bunnies and things like that. Maybe you want to be a biologist or, you know, you like digging in the ground. Maybe you maybe you uh, want to be an archaeologist. You know, I think having the conversation maybe with parents at the elementary and uh, middle school uh, step in the in in our in our lives is a good way to go about it. And then I think when we get to the high school level, I don't know that I see career fairs happen anymore. At least I don't see I didn't see it happen at high school. Um, maybe there are some that still do it, but back in 2004 and uh, between 2000 and 2004, when I was in high school, I don't think I saw a single career fair. So, you know, if I were to have gone to something like that, maybe there would have been, you know, an environmental professional or a planner or something like that there to where I could have had an opportunity to have a conversation. I, I think the only time that I ever had any conversation that was some semblance of planning or um, or anything like that was just in passing, talking to a girl um, in at my high school and her saying, you know what, I think I would be good at saying the grocery store needs to go here and the hospital needs to go here and we should put some houses there, you know, and she didn't know what it was either, but she, and she, and I don't think she even does anything in this line of work, but she was having the thought like of, the potential of what a career like that lo could look like, but not knowing that it could actually be a career. Um, so yeah, at the high school level, I would definitely say career fairs and maybe talking to counselors and, uh, you know, coordinating with them so that they're aware of questions. You know, you want to be an architect, for instance, in my, in my experience. Why do you want to be an architect? What is it about architecture that interests you? Oh, actually, that's not architecture. That's this other thing that you could you know, do. And so, um, you know, talking to parents, talking to counselors, talking to anyone who has an opportunity to influence, um, I guess, the youth um, in their, you know, decision making phase about what they want to do with their life. Um, you know, I, I think I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah, I think, you know, thinking about parents and counselors themselves, I don't I honestly I don't know that we've really talked about that much um, before. So I, I think that's a really really good approach and a good idea that, you know, is maybe a stone we hadn't, you know, overturned yet. Um, or maybe even our firms, you know, having um, uh, career days, you know, where we're just bringing in our own kids and our and our friends' kids and things like that so that they can just get exposed to the type of work that they do. Whenever, the earlier you can plant the seed, the better, because then they're already kind of along that trajectory of you know, environmental when they start making decisions about uh, college and things like that. So I think along, no, no, no. I think along those lines, and this is maybe, you know, a rare case of optimism for me is, you know, I, I think before we've seen as another barrier is, you know, being an environmentalist has been seen as kind of a luxury. And um, I think increasingly kids these days, whether, you know, high school or I don't know if you're seeing it in your kids yet, Kevin, but there's such an awareness about how critical it is to change the way we are doing things so that there is some semblance of normalcy left for kids that I think, yeah. you know, we no longer really need to make that argument about why this is important. I think instead it's more, you know, this is how you can do it. And this is, uh, you know, how, how you can do it and be successful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so often we're just happy when we hear our kids say, you know what, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer, but you can also be a different type of practitioner. You could be a CEQA practitioner as well, and you can still make a decent living for yourself. Like I had started talking about earlier, a lot of times, especially, you know, when, when you have parents have, who have come to America to try to give you a better life, there's more of a focus on, you know, success versus happiness. And I think that um, educating parents and, and students alike can help to show that, you know what, you can be successful doing this other thing, too, and maybe even happy at the same time, you know, so. I love that. And so, Kevin, as a as a leader in the industry and, you know, thinking about all these different issues and how how. 
there's a lot going on right in the world today. And so how do you take care of yourself to show up as a leader? Um, how do I take care of myself? I would say I try to unplug when I can. Um, you know, there's just so much going on in the day, um, in our in our day to day lives that I really appreciate the opportunity to just take a vacation and not and not worry about work, you know, from time to time. I've kind of been in this mind frame that I need to when I take those times to uh, just recharge and, and step away and I guess take care of me. Um, that it needs to be more of a long weekend than, you know, the two weeks off, you know, straight through because I need to be available and I don't want to miss out on, you know, too much that's happening uh, throughout the day and have, you know, all this stuff, you know, waiting for me when I get back. But just recently, I've kind of shifted my mindset that, you know what, if I'm going to be able to show up for people, I need to be able to show up for myself first. And by and and I need to take my vacation and take time off to be able to just mentally recharge so that I can try to try at least to be the best that I can be for the people that I, I work with. I love that. I love that mindset. It's so hard. I think, you know, as you develop your career and the busier you become and life outside of work and responsibilities grow and increase, it feels sometimes impossible to yeah. take a vacation and what's going to happen if I'm not here to do X, Y, Z. But at the other side of that coin is, I think when you're a leader and being in these roles, people are looking up to you and exhibiting the behavior that you exhibit. And so it's really setting a tone for what's acceptable and what the expectations are. And so kind of along those lines, like how does your organization or your department, like how do you take care of your people and your staff? Yeah, um, you know, outside of the general EAP that everyone has available to them <laughs> for their organization, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to be more intentional about is focusing on the training and development aspect of um, the job. You know, there's so many people who are entering the profession who may not have had an opportunity to have an internship or get any real experience uh, to prepare them for that job, you know, prior to applying for it. And um so we've been focusing a lot on trying to develop training programs to help facilitate that growth and, and mentorship programs so that people can feel comfortable going to someone when they don't have a when they don't know the answer to a question. A lot of times I, I feel like, you know, staff may be intimidated to go to their supervisor when they get stuck on something because they feel like they should know, you know, and um you know, you just don't, you don't know what you don't know. And so, but if you have someone that you're comfortable with, you know, that you can go to and kind of get these questions and it's like a step between sort more a mentor, I guess, is, is the word that I'm looking for, then maybe it makes you feel more comfortable. So, yeah, I think that's what we've been doing to really try to take care of our people. I mean, we have, you know, a good benefits program. I would say we have a fairly decent compensation package as well. Um, we offer, um, um, telecommute options, so hybrid options, so that people can work from home and try to take care of things. Um, you know, um, take care of what, whatever they need to if they if they have to work from home for a day or whatever. And um, yeah, that's I would say how our organization has been prioritizing uh, taking care of its people. Are you hiring? We are hiring. We are hiring for the associate <laughs> level. We are hiring for the associate level uh, flood control planner position, and so that position kind of functions as a project manager um, in in uh, one of the regulatory um, groups at flood control. And so basically, what they would do is, you know, function as a project manager at, would at a consulting firm, you know prepare reports or hire consultants to help prepare reports or sub consultants to help prepare reports and, and manage the uh, CEQA and regulatory permitting process for a particular project or program or, and things like that. So um, yes, we are hiring. Um, our, our application is live right now. We've got quite a few positions. So if there's anyone interested uh, in a job with Riverside County, feel free to uh, look me up on LinkedIn uh, and I can answer any questions or I'll answer the questions that I am able to with the job being live. But um, yeah, 
we're hiring and, and we're in need. <laughs> yeah. I actually saw your LinkedIn post that you're hiring. So I felt uh, comfortable. I was like, okay, <laughs> it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get you Thank some you. exposure. Yeah. And the biggest perk, you get to work with Kevin. Biggest perk. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what a joy. <laughs> no, but we really do. We have a great team of people um, that work at flood control, not just in regulatory, but also on our engineering side. And it's a really, um, collaborative family type environment. So, you know, there is a lot of us going to the engineers and saying, hey, what do you think about this instead of this? One of the things that we do for our projects is called a preliminary environmental assessment report, where that's exactly that. You know, our engineers are looking at various alternatives for a problem or a project that they're trying to do. And they're asking our input about what are the ramifications for each one of these alternatives from an environmental standpoint before we get too far invested with the design of that project. So um, we do a lot. I mean, I think we do lots of cool things, you know, with our projects. Um, I'm working on a really complicated project right now called the San Jacinto River Master Drainage Plan. And that one has really been a learning experience for everyone that has had to touch it. Um, we have an MSHCP here in Riverside County, and that project in particular has uh, uh, certain criteria that have to be met from an environmental standpoint. And so I say everyone is learning because, you know, our engineers at Flood Control are used to being able to just engineer something that, you know, gets water through it. Whereas with this project, it has a lot of biological requirements that have to be met. There are some special status plants that have very particular um, hydrology needs. And with us controlling where the water goes, we have to kind of take into account what is going to happen to those plant populations if the water off into a pipe or a channel or something like that. Is there a way that we can leave enough on the landscape so that those plant habitats can be replenished and um, restored, essentially? There's a lot that's been disrupted because of you know, agricultural farming and things like that. And so, and then there's also the complicating factor of not knowing a lot about what these plants need and having to figure out, you know, what's too much water, what's not enough water, um, you know, how frequently does it need to uh, flood, you know, that type of thing. So it's, it's super, it's super um, challenging, but it's also been a great growing experience for me. And I think the reason why I like it is because I see what's going to happen or what can happen from doing that project. We can restore, you know, a river system and it have all in it be home to all of these plants that are nearing extinction. And then also, you know, clear up the floodplain enough to allow development to come through and, and you know, build houses and, and shopping centers and things that we need, you know, in our community and in our in our, in our world. So it's a really cool project. Um it's very challenging again, but um, I think we've all, everyone who's touched it, you know, not just us at the flood control district or our consultant that's helping out with that project, um, but also the regulatory agencies as well, CDFW, US Fish and Wildlife, um, you know, just them trying to better understand as well, what are the requirements and how can we marry everyone's interests and, and still move forward with, with something, you know? So. <laughs> And Kevin, like you were describing, you went from, you know, being in the consulting world to now being, you know, on the, um, you know, public agency side of things. And, you know, I always like to think that, you know, being able to be on that public agency, you're serving the public, you're doing kind of the highest public good. But any other kind of big changes between being that consultant to now being an agency staff? Um, I would say the biggest change is just how I look at things. You know, I'm not just preparing CEQA documents and just, you know, um, putting information out there. We also try to, I, I, I guess I try to be a little more strategic about how we go about our projects. And, you know, again, I was, I was discussing that uh, preliminary environmental assessment phase or uh, report that we do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's looking at, I guess ways that we, or rather going from private to public has allowed me to really kind of take a step back and look at things from a more critical lens, but also from a standpoint of needing to get the project through from a, the, the, the community needs this or the, pro, or the, the, the city needs this or, you know, what, whoever. 
I was just sitting with this. I was thinking about, I've, I've never worked for a public agency, but I'm like, it's, it's everyone in the community. And so just having that responsibility to, I mean, I know there's policies and laws and regulations that need to be enforced and that guide that, but just having that, you know, end goal of like doing what's best for the community and the people, it is a big, I could see it being a big responsibility and also very rewarding and, and motivating yeah. and yeah. being able to like see the results of uh, all the, the work that you put into it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There was this one project that um, I shared on LinkedIn not too long ago, Batista Recharge Basin Project. And it was one of the first projects that I worked on um, when I came over to flood control. But it was just really cool. I just posted the video. It was just really cool to see it uh, be constructed because I know the problem that that project was solving. You know, I know that that area is in overdraft for the amount of water that they can pump. And so this project is going to help to uh, address some of that overdraft. So that, you know, I think coming over to the uh, public side, it gives you a little more of an investment in why you're doing that project as opposed to this project needs to be done. Here's a CEQA document that goes with it. These are the permits that are going to be required and that type of thing. Yeah. And well, I think ownership too, right, Kevin? Mm -hmm. You know, you get to see, you know, a more holistic view of the project and um, at least, you know, when I was a consultant, was you get the permit, you, you know, sometimes get to show up and get your little gold shovel and, you know, then you kind of call it a day and, um, yeah, think, yeah. you know, you being able to see it get implemented mm -hmm. and yeah, go ahead. It starts at that idea where the engineers have come up with, you know, these are four alternatives that we're looking at, us giving that feedback and, um, you know, doing the secret process, negotiating the permits with the regulatory agencies, but then also seeing it through, through construction, through mitigation implementation, and then also through maintenance, because our facilities are public, you know, infrastructure. They don't just exist all by themselves. There's also maintenance that has to happen. And that also has, you know, environmental regs and things that have to be followed to maintain it. So, so yeah, like you said, it's, it's, I guess, it gives you more of a sense of ownership, I would say, on the projects that you're working. And I, and to some extent, pride that you're doing something um, for the benefit of the public, really. Or you have a more involved role, rather, in that something that you're doing for the benefit of the public. Yeah, well, we're about at our, our time to wrap up, but I just, I want to thank you again oh, for your time. And I know, right? <laughs> it flies by. Um, but um, it was just really fun to hear you talk about your work and you really light up, you know, talking about your project work and your role with the district and what you all do. And um, it was just, uh, it was very energizing uh, to hear you talk about this and like, you can hear your passion and pride, uh, rightfully so coming through. So just wanted to to thank you for that. Oh, no problem. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you guys asked me to be a guest. Honestly, you know, when you first approached me, I was a little hesitant because I'm like, oh, I don't really, you know, do the public speaking thing. And, you know, this is, I never thought about it, but the more that I thought about it, especially in the context of what I was talking about earlier and wanting to see more you know, inclusion and diversity and representation, I thought this is a good opportunity for me to get out there, put myself out there and just kind of show that, you know, there are people that if, if you're a person of color, there are people that look like you that have been successful or, or are working towards being successful in this uh, in this industry. And so it's something maybe that you should consider as well. Yes. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, I should have brought that up earlier when you were talking about this, because in that this this session you mentioned earlier for the AEP conference, it was one of the first sessions, if not the first, focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, where that report was released that you referenced earlier about that, you know, 1% um, Black uh, members of AEP. Mm -hmm. And then you spoke up and said something about what you just said um, a moment ago about it, it'd be great to see Black uh, leadership and representation, see it more. I'm like, oh, well, Kevin, we have the perfect platform to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's funny because I guess I, I didn't really consider myself that person. You know, I'm yeah. saying, oh, I can see these things. And it's like, oh, well, what about you? You know? Yeah. So, no. you know, thank you for asking me. Thank you for asking because I will.
I guess I, at some point I would have realized that, oh, I am that, I can be <laughs> that change that I'm talking about, you know, um, but I, it, it, you, you help push it along, I guess I'll say. <laughs> Strongly encourage. And, and on that note, it's one of those things I was joking with someone the other day. I was like, the call's coming from in the house because that session we were talking about the sense of belonging and community. And um, one of the panelists, I remember saying afterwards, like we wanted to do this at the beginning of the conference. So people had that at the forefront of their mind or attendees had that forefront of their mind to go out and introduce themselves, put themselves out there. And I realized I'm like, oh, I, I have to be someone to go up and introduce myself to someone and, and be that person to someone who's, you know, not speaking like, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but, but we have to be the ones, you know, be yeah. the change you want to see. Right. Exactly. So exactly. anyway, if we're going to get into a whole other podcast in a minute, but uh, <laughs> we'll close <laughs> up <laughs> with the wrap up rapid five. Okay. So what is your favorite daily habit? say showering <laughs> my favorite daily habit is showering and I and I say that because I'm, I'm it's probably going to sound cliche but I do like a lot of thinking uh in the shower and it's just nice to be able to you know brain dump and process thoughts and you know all of that stuff and for some reason it just happens in the shower so showering is probably my favorite daily habit it's a meditative I love it and you usually um, get to be alone uh, in the shower too. So that's get it to be alone. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, and you can't multi, it's hard to like, you know, you have to put the phone down. Um, or yeah. you should at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. exactly. What are three things you'd bring to a deserted island? I would say probably my wife, uh, need some company while I'm going to be there. <laughs> um, a knife, you know, just in case there's any animals or we need to hunt for food or, you know, stuff like that. And um, I guess I would need two things. My my first thought was a Bluetooth speaker, but I would need something to play music into the Bluetooth speaker so that I can be entertained. So <laughs> I might have to trade out either the knife or the wife for the, for the, iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> for the iPhone so I can have music. But yeah, those are my... Those are my thoughts. We won't push you into that answer then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is your favorite environmental policy? You know, I, I guess I would have to say CEQA, honestly, because if it wasn't for CEQA, um, I'm not going to say I don't know where I would be, but I, I CEQA is what has allowed me to have a successful career, I would say. And um, again, it's one of the things that I think is is what makes California such an attractive place to live. I think CEQA helps to protect our natural resources and, you know, um, the views that everyone is usually trying to catch. You know, um, a, a lot of that, I think, is a result of CEQA. If not for that, maybe our air quality wouldn't be so good or maybe everything would be completely developed, you know, or you know, what, whatever. But I think CEQA is probably my, my answer for that. Hey, what is your favorite flora or fauna? Um, I would say a uh, candelabra aloe, aloe. Um, and I learned about that aloe maybe about five years ago or so. Um, my mom was sick with colon cancer and unfortunately passed away about five years ago. But um, I learned about it because when she was sick, by the time that she was diagnosed, her uh, condition was so far advanced that there was no amount of chemo that was going to be able to help her. And so we started looking into the more natural things that we could do to just kind of make her life a little easier. And one of the things that I found was this can candelabra um, aloe, and it's supposed to have a lot of healing properties, some that are specific to cancer. And so I bought some, I think off of Etsy, uh, planted it in our yard, used some of it for um, some concoction that I had found online that was going to help, you know, uh, my mom and, um, I planted it and it's just grown like a wildflower almost without much involvement for me. You know, it gets water from the rain and we'll, we'll water it from time to time as well, but it's grown so big that, you know, we've had to put it in multiple different pots from just a plant, you know, this size. So, I would say the resilience and also kind of the sentimental value that Aloe has to me related to my mom. 
Yes. Sorry to hear about her passing. And um, thanks for sharing that. What a special story. I love that. Thank you. I have to look it up now. Yeah. Okay. I, I, the plant is beautiful. And I, I looked it up while you were sharing your okay. story. Evan and it, you know, it's nice to hear the beautiful story with the beautiful images of that plant. Yeah. And uh, last one, if you could finish this thought, wouldn't it be cool if? Wouldn't it be cool if this interview went viral and it inspired someone, you know, out there who wasn't thinking about environmental to move toward that as a profession? I think that would be cool. <laughs> I love hey, that it. Would be so cool. Let's make it happen. Yeah, Listeners. let's get that membership up oh. to 2% next year. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Again, really, really appreciate you joining um, and look forward to uh, White Russians next year. Yes, yes. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I may have a new drink of choice at that point, but nonetheless, yes, I'm looking forward to being out with you guys again. <laughs> I think we can say we've outgrown the white Russian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Mental note. Right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to be updated when new episodes are released and leave us a review to let us know what you think. It also really helps us to share the podcast with others who may enjoy learning about the environmental industry. If you want to submit a shout out or any feedback, please send an email or voice memo to podcast at califaep.org. The email again is podcast with an S, podcast at califaep.org.